Hello, welcome to this Hangout with Physics World. Uh, it's the second time we've attempted one of these, if you joined us last time. Uh, so hopefully by now we're starting to find our feet slightly with the technology. So I'm James Dacey. I'm the multimedia editor of Physics World. And as you can see, I'm joined by two others. So we've got Mateen Durrani, magazine's editor. And we've got Louise Mayer, features editor. So in the Hangout today, we're going to be talking about the July issue of Physics World, of which I have a copy here. So it's a special issue about an exciting new field of research, which has been called the physics of cancer. So as it's a special issue, we're actually providing it as a free PDF download this month. So after the Hangout, if you want to pop over to physicsworld.com, uh, we'll provide details of how you can access that and have a good read. Um, so yeah, let, let's, let's push on with the, with the Hangout itself. So I don't know about you, but when I think about cancer and the type of people who study cancer, I wouldn't think of physicists immediately, I'd probably think of medics or bioscientists. So, Mathieu, I'll, I'll pass over to you to explain to everyone what we actually mean by the physics of cancer. Well, hello, hello everybody. Um, I suppose I should start by saying what physics of cancer isn't about. I mean, physicists have made lots and lots of contributions over the years to imaging cancer and treating it using x-rays and increasingly particles like um, protons and carbon ions. And there's a whole load of work being done by lots and lots of physicists around the world using x-rays and, and particles to treat and image cancer. And that's a really well-established field, and lots of contributions have been done to that. What we're talking about here is something very different. And essentially, we're talking about trying to understand cancer from a very fundamental level. Um, I mean, one really good example is the way that the physical properties of cancer cells behave. So, for example, there's a strange paradox or strange finding that, for example, cancer cells themselves are quite soft, but tumours made from cancer cells are quite hard. So, yeah, it's, it certainly sounds interesting from a, a physics point of view, but, I mean, cancer research, it's a really quite established field. I know in the US they spend billions of dollars every single year. So, I mean, is it realistic to think that physicists can really bring something new to the table? Well, that's, of course, a very interesting question, and um, physicists are often accused of being very arrogant. They come into a field, they think we can sort it all out with our own perspective and our, our views and our attitudes. So I think it's a very good question, but I think um, there are some really fundamental new approaches that they're taking, whether it's new techniques, new tools, and, of course, um, billions of dollars have been spent on cancer research over the years since, um, for decades, and cancer rates, the deaths from cancer have... have in some cases, not fallen very much, whereas other diseases, for example, heart disease, there have been huge progress and death rates from heart disease have fallen hugely since the 50s, let's say. Um, so there was a case that we need a different perspective, a fundamental new approach to understanding what cancer is. And if physicists can help in that endeavour and help to save lives, then you know they can bring some new, and if they can bring some new fresh ideas, new perspective, new thinking, you know, surely that's got to be a good thing. So, I mean, so Louise, you were, I know you were involved in the commissioning of this and commissioning a lot of the feature articles. I mean, it's, it, it sounds like you know, an emerging field, what Mateen is saying, but it's certainly not. Um, well, from what I see, it doesn't really seem to be on the map yet of mainstream physics. So was it tricky for you to actually draw up um, a list of the areas you wanted to cover in, 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 in this new field? Um, so, James, you, you say it's not on the map, but actually it, it is getting there. So, um, in the US, um, the National Cancer, Cancer Institute um, has funded um, 12 centers um, that are bringing, well, physicists, engineers, mathematicians, oncologists, cell biologists, well, they're bringing them all together. Um, so, so there is a lot of funding going into it, and, and there is quite a bit of activity going on already. Um, so yeah, deciding what to focus on. Um, yeah, I didn't. I didn't know much about about the field, um, other than I'd read an article on it a few years ago and thought, "Wow, what's this? Sounds really interesting." Um, and so, for the past few years, um, every time I've been to a, a conference, like um, I went to the American Physical Society conference this year, the um, American Association of the Advancement of Science conference last year, and they they had um, multiple sessions on the physics of cancer. So I went to those. Um, I learned about what kind of topics there are. Um, and I also went to a dedicated Physics of Cancer conference in Leipzig in Germany last year. Um, so that gave me a kind of 
feel for the field. Um, but um, I still didn't, didn't feel like I was this expert and I, I knew exactly what was the most interesting thing. So um, I got in touch with a guy called Paul Davies, who is, um, he's written for Physics World a few times, he's kind of a friend of Physics World, and he's the head actually of one of these National Cancer Institutes in the US at Arizona State University. Um, so I asked him his opinion as well, you know, what does he think is hot and, and what would he recommend? Yeah, so yeah, his name has cropped up quite a few times, hasn't it, over the years? He seems, he's like quite an interesting chap, so I know he's been involved in things like SETI initiatives as well. I mean, Bettine, you, um, you had experience working there. What's, what's he like? Well, Paul Davis first came to fame in the 80s when he, he's a British physicist and he famously, <coughs> excuse me, quit the UK um, back then, um, unhappy with um, the Thatcher government's cutting of the science budget. He went off to Australia and made his name there as a cosmologist and quantum physicist. And um, I think in about 2006, he went over to the Arizona State University to set up what's called the Beyond Center, which looks at very fundamental far out um, research across the whole of physics, I think particularly focusing on cosmology. And then out of the blue, as Louis said, um, the National uh, Cancer Institute in the US approached him to set up one of these physical science oncology centers and to help out and actually runs one of these now. Um, and he, he was quite surprised to be asked about to, to help support and lead this initiative because of course he didn't know anything about cancer. And I think for them that was very much the key. They wanted someone who didn't know anything about the subject, who had no preconceptions. They could come in, look at it with a really fresh pair of eyes and try to get a fundamental understanding of what cancer is, what causes it. And um, as you say, his name does crop, crop up quite a lot, and uh, we were very pleased when he agreed to write this particular feature for us. So, Louise, what, what is this, this feature about, Paul, Paul Davis' feature in the issue? Yeah, so as well as um, being, being a good advisor, um, yeah, he also, I also invited him to write an article for the issue. Um, and it's because he um, and his colleague, Charles Leimweaver, they've come up with um, something they call a theory of cancer. Um, so I'll give you a, a vague idea of what it's about, but but read read the article to get the the, the full idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so cells in our body um, they're usually programmed um, when to die uh, and when to multiply. So our, the cells in our body, as as you may know, they're continually kind of one dies and get, it gets renewed. Um, um, but the theory is to do with um, um, this, this sort of cell death and multiplication is um, controlled by the genes. Mm -hmm. um, but, but in cancer, um, the, the, idea, the idea of the theory is that these um, the, 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 the instructions saying die or whatever get turned off. Um, and actually the cell reverts to a really ancient kind of cell which has more um, more in common with single-celled organisms, like before multicellular organisms existed, when all they wanted to do was just multiply, 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 and they had no reason to, to die or, or to, to grow very slowly. Um, and Paul actually um, had this, this phrase, which I thought was a really good quote in his article, and it is, um, to use a computer analogy, um, cancer is like Windows defaulting to safe mode after suffering uh, an insult of some sort. Um, but yeah, I'm being quite vague, but, but honestly, that's not, not a full picture. You should read the article too. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no offence to Windows there as well. I'm sure it usually works well. So it's, it's, it's almost like these, these cells are reverting to kind of a selfish, really resilient form that just kind of multiplies then. Is that what you're saying? Um, it, it is a lot more subtle, um, and there's kind of evidence which is to do with early stage embryos where cells are what you call pluripotent and they could still turn into any type of cells. Um, I'm not biologist, cell biologist, so I just kind of know enough to, to work with Paul on editing the feature, but yeah, you should read it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to. <laughs> I understood most of it. Um, so, I mean, the other features um, in issue, they're, they're, they're not quite so um, grandiose, yeah, they're not presenting these overarching theories, they're focusing on uh, specific aspects in this field. So I don't know if you want to just say a little bit about the other features as well, Louise. Sure. So, yeah, I wanted to kind of give a flavour of some different approaches physicists are using. Um, 
in, in one of the stories, um, it's about how um, electric fields, believe it or not, can be used to um, control, oh, I can't remember what it is. They can control the um, polarization of the cell, can't they? Yeah. Um, so they can, so electric fields can somehow be used to detect cancer, and they can potentially be used to suppress cancer. Um, and at the moment, the experiments are in the kind of stages of playing with uh, tadpoles and flatworms. So it's still early stages, but it's amazing that that, that the tumours can actually be controlled simply using an electric field. So it's kind of you're kind of rotating the the, uh, the tumours that are using the field. Sorry, James. How are you actually using the field? What's the what's the suggestion? The electric field applied to the tumor cells. It's something to do with um, the, the electric potential in cells, but um, yeah, I'm not I'm not the expert again. You know, this is just a flavour. Yeah, can... sure. And then so to the other features, kind of look at the uh, is it the, the mechanics of cells? That's right. There's another one, um, and, and the story behind that one is. Um, um, breast can breast cells um, when when they grow they they form these uh, spherical structures called a cini. Um and what uh, physicist Candice Tanner found was that when when these structures are forming um, she she found a way of imaging them and, and actually showed that they rotated very slowly so it was like you know wow what is physical rotation got to do with mm -hmm. forming these structures. Um, and also, when when you disrupt the, the the rotational motion so that they're just still, these structures um, they become like amorphous blobs. They're not healthy structures at all. And and this is what um, breast cancer cells turn into these amorphous blobs as well. So there's this question mark over: Is there any kind of link between um, the physical rotation of these cells and healthy versus cancer? I mean, it, all, it does sound really fascinating, you know, to me with a physics background, uh, and and to you guys, obviously. Uh, but I mean, is, is there a danger with all this that, um, you know, to somebody who's been working in the field for a long, long time, somebody with a, uh, a medical background, um, is there a danger that maybe uh, they would think it was possibly slightly arrogant of physicists to suddenly turn up and say, you know, we can bring fresh insights uh, into this field that you've spent your entire life working on? What, what would you think about that routine? Oh, absolutely. I mean, physicists are always accused of being arrogant, and I can imagine biologists and geneticists who see cancer as a disease of the genes, which has been the traditional view. Um, either this isn't on their radar, this work, or they think it's a sideshow or irrelevant, and they're concentrating on creating cures for people right now who are suffering from cancer, and they obviously feel that that's the most important thing for them, finding treatments right now. I don't think any of the work that Louise mentioned is about to lead to a treatment at any time soon. Um, and so they probably think, well, that's all very interesting, but what's the point of doing that kind of work? I think the physicists will always take the long-term view that let's understand it from basic principles, from uh, get a really good understanding, and then that at some point in the future will lead to some sort of cures and treatments. I mean, no one's actually saying that this is about to happen. Um, but for example, I think one thing that Paul Davis mentioned to me, and I think is in the article, he talked about the fact that if we understand metastasis, the process where cancer cells can then go around the body and um, end up in other organs. For example, if you could understand what causes that or how it happens, you could maybe get an understanding of, um, maybe be able to get an earlier diagnosis of that happening even before it's actually taken place. And of course, that could lead to a better life for somebody or a cure further along the line. So if you can understand metastasis at an earlier stage before it's actually happened, um, that could be a great advantage, of course. I think Paul mentions that 90% of people with cancer who then suffer from this metastasis, they end up sadly dying. So um, if you can get that earlier in the day, then of course that, that could be a really good thing. And, and the other example he talks about is, um, or I know about, is using nanoparticles to carry um, drugs, conventional drug cancer drugs, to the right part of the body. And trying to understand the physical principles of how these nano cages take the drugs to new parts of the body um, could be really, really interesting. So you're talking about combining some new insights with existing treatments. Um, so yeah, there will be certain people who will think, yeah, physicists are being a little bit arrogant. Um, 
and yeah, kind of that's kind of what they've always been been over the years. But they can, and in fact, since the issue was published, somebody wrote to us saying, you know, I think people physicists should be wary of promising too much, and uh, maybe they can chat about what they've done once they've done it. But at this point, maybe a bit more um, modesty is in order. <laughs> I just wanted to also clarify that ninety percent fact. So it's um, of of people who die from cancer in ninety percent of the cases, metastasis was involved. Mm -hmm. Because it's just actually, we um, we also asked our followers on on our Facebook page. Uh, we had a poll question. Uh, this was a couple of weeks ago, and we we asked people to name what they think um, is the most important attribute a physicist could bring to the table um, when it comes to cancer research. And and the one that actually stood out above the others was so the ability to pick out key variables within a complex system. So that I mean, that kind of touches on some of the things you two were talking about there as well, particularly. But uh, Paul Davis and his overarching theory. Um, and I think it's probably about all the time we have for us there, actually, with, with the discussion. Um, so I should say, um, if you want to see this again, um, later on this afternoon, we'll be posting a recording of the video onto um, our website, which is physicsworld.com. Uh, and I'll also be providing details there of how you can download uh, the free PDF copy. And uh, to members of the Institute of Physics, um, as always, they'll have access to the full digital version of the magazine. Uh, so this month, there's also some extra features in that. So that includes uh, a series of four videos that I helped produce in Boston. Uh, so we went to this hospital there, the Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, it's a really pioneering center where they're developing uh, proton therapy treatment for cancer research. So it's well worth checking those out as well. Uh, so if you want to find out how you can get access to that and how you can get access to Physics World every single month, if you go to physicsworld.com. Oh, uh, thanks guys for joining me today. It's been, been really interesting. Thank thanks you. everyone for, for joining us. See you next time. Bye.